What I love about student ministry is everybody around, the community, the friendships you make. It's like a big family here. It's like you're always gonna feel welcome no matter what. I really love uh, getting to do activities, just like games and stuff like that, um, to hang out with friends and to get to know a lot of other people. I, there, I know there's uh, fun and games a lot of the time, but there's always a time where we need to uh, realize why we're really here, and that's to um, talk about God. I've seen my faith kind of grow in the fact that like I can't do it alone. And so with the community and how great everybody is, you can build like off of that. And so you see like your friendships and like you're in it together. It's not like you're facing stuff just by yourself in a corner, you know? I was struggling to find myself believing in God. And I was just like, how can I really know that God is real? Like, I feel like my personally, my brain works in a way like that it only believes things when it like logically sees it and believes that it's physically possible. And so I went to Cody and I was talking to him about it and he really helped me to uh, realize that it is possible. And my two favorite things about the staff are they're all very like alive. Like they know how to like have fun and do all that kind of stuff. And it's not just like this big teaching moment. It's like, I'm going to tell you this because I can relate to this. And I also like just how easy they are. Like you don't have to work to try to be their friend. They're gonna invite you to go places. It's not like you're saying like, hey, if you're not busy, can we please do this? They like want to do stuff. I think Stonebridge and The Bridge have like the coolest people ever. You come here on Sundays, you get hyped back up, you go Monday and then you come here on Tuesdays, you're good. Like it's a place where like everybody here is here for you and not against you. So it's really cool to build that community and friendship that like nobody here is going to judge you for what you think. All right, good morning. Uh, you probably noticed in your handout, there's a uh, insert there that says youth. And uh, we're doing this uh, every Sunday of the month. We're talking about something that has to do with our general budget, the budget of the church, how we operate and what we do. And so we wanted to highlight uh, this week the youth. Last week we highlighted the family life, ministry, and uh, kids. And it really excites me uh, to talk about the youth and what they do and why when you give and you volunteer and you work with the youth, why it makes such a difference. Because our goal a long time ago was to help raise a generation and another generation and another generation with a, an understanding of who God is, what Jesus Christ did, um, the power of uh, God's Word in their life, this relationship that we wanted to help them build because we knew that uh, they were the future. You, you may not know this if you haven't been here a long time, but when we first purchased this property, uh, we purchased 50 acres, which is uh, a lot of property, and we bought it. Research forest in the woodlands didn't even come out this far. It only went uh, to you know several blocks up in front of that, but there was a guy in the church who said, no, it's coming this far, uh, we'll be right by Research Force, a major street, and we had to trust him because <laughs> uh, he owned the property. He had picked up this property in pieces and built it, and he decided this would be a great uh, place for the church to build and would give the uh, church a future, and we had to trust him, and it ended up that he was genius and uh, knew exactly what he was talking about. He actually took me out um, near where Research Force is now, and back then it was just woods and swamp land. And I had on boots because he told me, you might get bit by something. And uh, so I, I had on boots and walked out there, and I'm, I'm just telling you, have you ever been like this before, just kind of confused? He's like, this is the future. And I'm sitting there going, oh, help me, you know. <laughs> because I knew if you, know, if you stand up and you say, hey, here is the future, and, and the church invests in that, and you find out, yeah, it's still swamp land, you know, that, uh, that uh, I'm looking for another job. Because they're like, who led us to do something like this? But it was entirely different. We, uh, we purchased it. When we met with the Woodlands, you don't know this party. This was really uh, fun. We met with the Woodlands. The Woodlands came, looked at land, all the stuff that they were doing, and they brought this plat of our land and their land. And one of the guys uh, that was on the team kind of working on it said, where is the land we bought on this plat? And I told him, I leaned over, I said, see that kind of oval part in the middle and it says 20 acres? He said, yeah. That's what the Woodlands wants us to keep. 
They're going to take the rest of it. That's their plan. And so we had to tell them, eh, you know, it's not really our plan that we would give up 30 acres out of the 50. Even though we did, we had to give them about four acres um, in, in the deal. And, uh, but that's not really our plan. We're kind of thinking that there's, you know, more to the future and that this is what we want to do. And you may not know this, but the very first building that we ever built on this property, anybody know which building it was? Yeah, the youth know. It was the bridge down there. That's the very first building that we ever built. So the youth could come here and they were the first, in a sense, occupiers of the land. Them, some rabbits and, you know, and, and, and things that had never seen humans. And, and, and they were out here and they sort of started it because we knew that we wanted to, to buy a piece of property that had a future. And that our youth were our future and our kids were our future. And we wanted to build a future. And, and I don't know about you, but for me, I want to be a part of something that, that extends into the future and that gives uh, them a chance. And so that's why I, I am not embarrassed or bashful at all the, to uh, ask you to give to the, the budget that supports the youth. And I'm not embarrassed uh, definitely at all to thank you because I know so many people have been so faithful so that we could build these things and do these things. And just to let you know, there's more ahead. There's more ahead. There always is. God always has more ahead. Future plans. Some people want to be more aggressive. I understand that. Boy, some people are ready. You ever been around somebody that they're a builder? You know, let's, okay, we've got to build something else. Got to build something else. Got to be, there are people in here, that's what you do for a living. I understand. Other people are like, well, hang on, you know. Let's not move too fast. Um, uh, I'm in that mode. Just let you know, that's me. You know, I'm one of those. This don't take too many risks. Just don't jump out there too fast. And the truth is you need both, don't you? You need patience and you also need aggressiveness. Anyone marry someone not like them? Yeah, because you realize you need both. Yeah, absolutely. My wife is the go-getter. She's ready to go. She's usually got a bag packed just in case. I mean, she does. And I'm the one, you know, I don't know if this is just being a man, but I'm the one that says, well, here's the thing. I, I like to go places, but when you go places, you know what? You don't know where you're going because you've never been there before. And, you know, and things are different. And, and my, my TV changer is right here. And, and it works on this TV really well. And I know where the refrigerator is, you know, right here. And the mailbox is just, you know, a couple of hundred feet down the road. And some people see it one way, some people see it, you know, another. But you have to have both if you're going to make it. You have to have both if you're going to grow and you're going to be, you know, consistent. We have people in the church. Um, I love to talk about this. We, we just were reviewing uh, numbers this weekend with the directors in the church. And we have uh, over 400 people, uh, volunteers in the church, who have been trained to work with youth and children, formally trained uh, to do that, to go through things so that it's safe and so that it works. And I'm sitting there going, that blows my mind, that that many people would have a vision for this and would invest their time uh, into this. And there are, there are so many more needs and so much more ahead. That is great. You know, we're going to go after those things also. So I'm just throwing that out to you because I also want to talk to you about this morning about unpacking your confusion. Because when you, when you talk about uh, youth, kids, a new generation, uh, maybe, you know, you feel this way. Um, it's, it's a more confusing world now than it ever was. It is. You have more choices you have more voices speaking into you to try to get you to choose one direction over the other. There, there are all sorts of things that you're going to struggle with in the world now that if you look back, this is why most of us do look back and say, boy, wouldn't it have been great to be in, you know, the time of King Arthur and, you know, when you didn't know if you were going to eat and uh, you didn't have a warm place. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it have been great to be back there? And most of us go, Seriously? You know, why would you think that way? Because you, you look back and it was a simpler time. That's why. Because you say, well, I can figure that out. Today, it seems that things become more and more and more and more complicated. It become more and more difficult in life. And so you, you need direction. You need someone to help you to, to figure out, okay, how am I going to make choices? Which way am I going to go? I brought a bag with me because this is my, I would call this my confusion bag, only because... It's big, right? And uh, if you look at it, it's got fragile on it. Um, it's, it's got a, uh, a tag up here that says heavy. Oh, yeah. Because we carry a lot of emotions with us as we try to make decisions. And if you're like me, your life is just filled with emotions. 
In fact, I, I know some people, and I call them, I'm not going to tell you who, but I, I know some people, and I call them emotional hoarders because they've got the bag so stuffed and filled because they never know what situation they're going to run into and which emotion they want to be able to express. Now, I'm not just saying all of us have different emotions, right? You know, fear, anxiety, happiness, you know, generosity. I mean, there are all these things that we feel. But, but I know some people, they don't just have that emotion in the bag. They have a whole, a whole outfit built for that emotion. You know people like that? I mean, they, it's an ensemble. They are ready. And because of that, their, bit, their bag that they carry around is huge. It is enormous. You'll see them come to the airport and say, oh, you're going away for a couple of weeks. Said, no, just overnight, you know, but you never know. So I, got, I have to carry everything. Why, why, would I, why would I, you know, narrow it down? Have you ever done this? Have you ever traveled somewhere? I'm sure you have. You come back and you look in your bag and you open it up and you, then you realize how much of the stuff in your bag you, what? You didn't need. Yeah. What was I thinking? Why was I carrying all of that stuff with me? The one thing that's really good about being married to a, a, someone who wants to be on the go all the time is my wife forces me to narrow it down because we have to travel light because it's just always on the go. So I, I've really learned to travel light. I have a friend, he's actually in the service. He's like me. As far as we're concerned, we'll put on one pair of pants and carry a pair of shorts. That's all I need, you know. I know you think, well, what if it gets dirty? Ah, uh, you just, you know, you keep wearing it anyway. You know, you just, that's all you need, no matter how long you're gone. One pair of shoes, one pair of socks. I won't go any further than that, you know, but, you know, that's, that's it. Plus, you look at it and say, and where we're going, they'll never see me again. So, you know. So it was dirty. So I wore the same pants for a week. Who know? Who cares? You know, I don't know these people. You ever been like that before? <laughs> Joni and I, when we were first married, uh, had no money, and um, going off on our honeymoon, we decided to uh, to go uh, up toward uh, Northern California. Uh, it was actually kind of tied to that. We were in, uh, went to Hawaii, and then we came back. We were up, and we were driving up in Northern California. And this was before the days of cell phones. I know, like 1800s. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's, so you had no way of, of knowing where you're going or, or booking things that way. So she had to look up some things. We're up in Northern California, and we're looking for a place as cheap as we can get. And there are no cheap places in Northern California. And, um, and back in those days, very few places would take a credit card. So you had to have cash. Well, we had a little bit of cash, but we didn't want to go and blow it. So every place we went, we finally found some place pretty cheap. Uh, don't take a credit card. We finally found this place that was a part of her work they'd advertised and said, you might want to check this place out. We found it really late, went in there. They only took cash, but at least it wasn't that expensive. And then we realized maybe this was a mistake because as we checked in and we got to our room, we, re we, we figured out that we're the only people in the entire hotel, except for the person, you know, back at the counter. And I went back there and he was gone. So, you know, the only, so this felt like one of those scary movies to me. I mean, I just thought, you know, you can hear some music and some guy's going to come through with a chainsaw. That, that's just the way, you know, I, I kind of figured it out. And, uh, but, you know, but we enjoyed it. And then at 1 o'clock in the morning, someone else checked in, and they put him in the room above us. So we were so thankful for that. And, um, yeah, we had to get up at 6 the next morning because we had to, to keep moving and be somewhere. Uh, we were pretty loud, just to let you know, because the 1 in the morning people decided to order pizza at 1 in the morning and, uh, and have a few beers. And so they had a good time that night. I think they went to bed about 4. And so we helped them wake up at 6, you know, even below them. And uh, so it was, it was a fun experience. We had a great time. But, you know, when you travel and you do things and you go through life, sometimes it's confusing. Sometimes it's difficult. So this is what I want to do. I want to talk to you about how do you unpack these emotions in your life and decide which ones do I want to keep and which ones do I want to make prominent because they're all there. Uh, all of us have, you know, just multiple emotions. But, but here's, what, here's what happens with confusion with your emotions. Confusion causes you to doubt your direction. That's the way it works. When you become confused in life and you're not sure which emotion to follow or to play off of, you're not sure which way you're going. And you just kind of get stuck standing still, you know, with your bag, with all your emotions there, and you just don't know which way to go. And there's nothing worse than having no idea which plane do I get on, which train do I get on, which road do I get on, is it time to get up and move, is it time to stay? 
And all of these emotions just add to the doubt of our lives when we become confused which emotion to follow and which emotion to chase. So I want to take a look at two different places in the Bible. This is not the only place. Here's what you'll do is you start reading uh, the Bible. You will notice everywhere you go, there's something in there about making decisions about coming up and saying, this is what I should do. It's, it's just absolutely loaded, and especially in the New Testament, because this is what the, the Bible was there for, were all these new people who are believers and deciding, who, what are you going to listen to? Who are you going to listen to? How are you going to find direction in your life? Otherwise, you just kind of get stuck spinning around, going nowhere, not sure what to do, and just living in confusion. So I want to take you to, uh, this is the book of James. There's a lot that I could pull out of there, but I'm just going to pull a few things out of it to, uh, to try to uh, help you this morning, and then we'll jump to one other place. Um, James is one of those books very, very forceful in his directions. But, it, but if, you, if you look at them and you listen to them, you'll find there's a real purpose for why James is like this. And it can really help you as you're making decisions in your life. Here's the first thing that I picked out of when I, uh, James when I was reading in it. Um, here's the first one is... You ask God for wisdom. The first thing you do is you ask God for wisdom when you're making decisions. Listen to what James says. He writes this. He says, if you need wisdom, catch this. Ask our, and he describes God. Ask our who? Generous God. Wow. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God. He will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking, but when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver. For a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in everything they do. So here's what he's saying. Listen, if you ask, if you want wisdom, go talk to God. Why wouldn't you? I, I know that, that, that we kind of know this, but the question is, is this something that we actually do? Do we go to God and ask? Because as James is pointing out, there's another voice and there's another type of wisdom that is constantly being thrown at us and thrust upon us, and that is a worldly wisdom that is counter to who God is. And you have to make a decision. Do you want to hear from God? Do you want to follow God? Do you believe that, that, that God is the one who created the world? He owns the world. It's his Ultimately, it will go where he wants it to go. Or if you decided, no, you know what? I don't know that I believe that. And that's what he's talking about, this wavering. Because if we're unsure, and we're, then we're unsure which voice we're going to listen to to try and um, get through our confusion. It only leaves us more confused. Because in the world, you have every voice in, in, in the world just coming at you. And so there's no clear direction. But with God, there is always clear direction. God cuts through those things. God speaks to us about our lives, who we are, where we're headed, so that you can eliminate a lot of the voices. They're still there. And you can deal with your emotions and the confusion that you have. And you can decide, no, this is where I want to go. This is what I want to do. I was on the plane the other day. Have you ever been on the plane like this? And a voice comes over the loudspeaker, right? You know, just to let you know, this plane is headed to Milwaukee. If you don't want to get, go to Milwaukee, please hit your call button now and approach a flight attendant. You ever been on something like that before? And you might think, well, why in the world would they get on this plane if they don't want to go to that destination? But we look at our lives and so many times, the direction we're following, we're confused. We're like, do we really want to go there? Is that really where we want to end up? And we're not sure. That confusion, that confusion makes it difficult for us to stay on track and to uh, point in the right direction. Here's the second thing that I was, I was looking in this first chapter. I noticed that he also talks about that you're not to waver in your focus. This is, this is James' admonition, God's admonition to us. Don't waver in your focus. Look at what he says. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Say this part with me. Every good gift and every what? Perfect gift. Is from above, coming down from the Father is lights. And I love the, the English um, a standard version here, the translation, coming down from the Father of lights, whom there is no variation or shadow due to what? 
change. I, the reason I like this is because that's why shadows move, because change is occurring in life. It's not going the same way. And so the shadows move, and the shadows cause us to become confused about what we're supposed to do, which way we're supposed to go. We used to think, okay, I knew exactly, and now a couple of years later, I'm saying, well, now I'm not sure. I'm not saying that God doesn't, when you follow him, that the path is always absolutely straight going in the direction. God moves you. But it's the shadows and the shifting things of circumstances, opinions, the world itself that causes us so many times to get disoriented, to fall into confusion once again, and to miss the direction that we're going. I've told you that some people, you know, are just, they're outspoken about, they know they're going to follow God, they will tell you they're going to follow God. And sometimes when you read in the Bible, you see stories of people's lives that it's not so outspoken, but if you look at the story and you see what they did, it is. One of my favorite is in the Old Testament is Joseph. And Joseph at 17 years old, he's sold by his brothers into slavery in Egypt. So Joseph, this is what screams in the book. It doesn't, doesn't talk about how Joseph re read the Bible constantly. They didn't, there wasn't a Bible then. You know, but he'd been taught the things of the uh, Old Testament about who God was. What it says is that Joseph remained faithful to God and to Potiphar, the guy who owned him. Like, why, why would you do that? He saw them as going together because this is where God has placed me. God has put me here. I'm going to remain faithful. And you say, well, how do you know that? Why do you say that? Because it says that Joseph prospered and that Potiphar gave him more and more of the responsibility of his life. Why? Because he could trust him. He knew he could trust him. And before long, it says that Joseph was in a position where everything that happened in Potiphar's life was run by Joseph. He did it all. Potiphar didn't have any decisions to make because Joseph took care of everything, so much so that Potiphar's wife decided that I want Joseph. And so when she tries to seduce Joseph, Joseph gives Potiphar an answer. It says everything about Joseph's relationship to God. He says, listen, I can't do this. How could I do this to Potiphar? And you think, what, what do you mean? You're loyal to Potiphar? He was. He had absolutely, in, in, he intended to stay loyal to Potiphar. How could I do this to Potiphar? And how could I do this to God? By taking the only thing that Potiphar has said, you can't have that. The only thing. Sounds like Genesis, doesn't it? <laughs> you can eat of any fruit, any tree, just not that one. And what he was saying was, how could I betray Potiphar and how can I betray God? This means Joseph is looking at it, and he realizes who's watching after his life. He's, he's sure of it. He's confident. And you may think, well, wait a minute, but, but you're in a foreign land. You, you are a slave. In this case, it goes badly for him. He ends up in prison in Egypt also. Yes, I'm sure that, that, that Joseph struggled. He's like, man, God, I don't understand. I'm, I'm trying to be faithful. Why would it work out this way? But Joseph was a man who had decided that's going to be my focus. In one sense, you might, you might look at it and say, Joseph decided this is my only hope anyway. But of course, most of us in his situation, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't operate that way. We'd become bitter. We'd become depressed. We would, we would struggle and we would let our struggles take over. But Joseph, for some reason, is still looking to God and putting his trust in God. Think of how it works out. Where, where Joseph, or you and I might think, God, you're letting my life fall apart. Joseph is hanging on and somehow believing that God is watching after him. And all along, God is doing the very opposite. Joseph, Joseph's life is not falling apart deeper and deeper, even though it may seem like it. Instead, God is positioning Joseph's life further and further up the ladder so that in several years, Joseph is actually the one that the Pharaoh of Egypt picks once again to be over everything in his life. You run it all. You rule it all. Why? Listen, it's, it's in, in, the, in the book of Genesis, it's undeniable. You, you cannot possibly read the stories and miss this one thing. Joseph is put in these positions because he did not waver. He struggled, 
But he did not waver. He decided, this is what I'm going to believe. This is what I'm going to hold on to. God will lead me and God will guide me. My decisions are not that hard to make. This is what I'm going to do. This an incredible story, isn't it? Here's what uh, James also says. Um, here's a, a third point to this. Um, you need to post in your life some what I call uh, early directional notes, some early warning notes in your life. So that you can say, oh man, be careful. I don't want to go off the rail here. I don't want to go in a direction that God does not want me to go. And here's what he says, beginning in verse 19. He says, I I like this. This is from a paraphrase called the message, Eugene Peters paraphrase. And I I love his language here. This is how he paraphrases uh, these verses. He says, post this in all the intersections, dear friends. It's kind of like, you know, traffic signs everywhere. Here's what you post. Lead with your what? That means listen. <laughs> listen to God. Go to God. Listen to, the, you know, to people around you. Be, be attentive. Lead with your ears. Follow with your, yeah, with your words, with your tongue. See, I, one of our problems is, I'm, I, me too, I'm the same way, we tend to lead with our words. We tend to even when, when we're listening to someone else, not listen to someone else, but instead think about what we are about to say and why what we have to say is so important. Now, here's the problem with that. You never learn when you're like that. You don't. You can't learn with your speaking. You can only learn with your ears. You, 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 you take in wisdom and you take in knowledge this way. So I like how you paraphrase it. Lead, lead with your ears Follow up with your tongue, and, I, and this is great, isn't it? Let anger straggle along where? Yeah, in the rear. And you know what? If you lead with your ears, there's a good chance that you can let your anger, your frustration, you know, straggle along behind rather than let it get out in front of your life and just lead you in the wrong direction because it has overcome you. He says in verse 21, So throw all spoiled virtue. Sounds like the right thing, but it's not and cancerous evil in the garbage. In simple humility, let our gardener, God, landscape you with the Word, making a salvation garden of your life. So why should you take your decisions to God? Why should you make decisions in life? Because listen, when you take your decisions to God, one of the things that you're going you're gonna to have to do is you're going to have to learn to listen to Him, and you have to say, God, you know, you, more, you know more than I do, and, but my, I know my tendency is to say, Here, but here's what I want. Here's how I want it to turn out. And, and that's a struggle for me. That's why I tend to speak quickly because I'm trying to get it to be the way I want it to be rather than listening and learning from who you are. Uh, why would you want to do this? And I did put this uh, in your outline also because the decisions you make um, are a reflection of what occupies your what? Your mind. Sure they are. How you make these decisions are a reflection of what you have decided to focus on and what will occupy your mind. So here, let me give you five things. And this is from the first chapter of, of uh, Paul's letter to the Philippians. If you ever read Philippians, man, just a great letter. Incredible. It's uplifting. It's, it's, it's inspiring. It's joyful. But the whole letter that he writes to the Philippians is all about listening to God and all about following Jesus with your life. And this is the best way it's going to work out. Now, here, here's what I love about this, this uh, letter. Paul is writing this while he is in prison in Rome, 800 miles away from the Philippians. And you're going to catch the tone of this and think, why would anyone in prison be writing in this way? Well, it's similar to Joseph. It's because of how Paul now understood life, and it was that those thoughts and what entered his mind about what life was all about because of his relationship to God that dominated for Paul and changed everything for him. So here are five thing, or four things I picked out. First of all, because uh, Paul says, because God will finish what he starts. God is faithful. God can be trusted. Um, you and I, as we look around in the world, we can't figure it out. We can't pick it all out. But here's what you see in Joseph's life. You saw this in Paul's life. Paul would say, but God will finish the things he started. You may not understand how, but he will finish what he starts. Here's what he says in verse uh, 6 of the first chapter. He says, for I am certain that God who began the good work within who? You. That's what he's talking to the people he's right. God began something in you. He goes on and say, he will continue this work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. 
So it is right that I should feel as I do about you, for you are, have a special place in my heart. You know what that means? In my feelings. I, I know what to feel about you. I feel excitement. I feel joy about, about you because I know God who started this work in you that he is going to finish this work that he has begun. Second thing that I noticed was um, he's talking about how God is, is able to sort out what really matters in your life. And this is key for sorting out your emotions. Which emotion do I follow? Um, which direction do I go? This is absolutely key for you to be able to sort those things out and know which ones are the important ones and the ones that really matter and which ones are just secondary and don't matter as much. Look at what he says in verse 9. He says, I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. He's talking about a knowledge and understanding of who God is and God's ways. That's what he's talking about. He says in verse 10, for I want you to understand, catch this, for I want you to understand what, say it with me, what really matters. I want you to understand what, that's knowledge and understanding. Here's what really matters. These other things, yes, they're there. They're part of it. Yeah, you have feelings that, that are contradictory, but they're not really the most important ones. I want you to understand, he says, what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day Christ Jesus returns. Do you see the connection that he made? He made a connection between understanding and knowing what really matters, what really counts, knowing and listening to the direction that God gives, the understanding that God gives, and living a pure and blameless, a holy life, a special life. Now think about it. Of course it makes sense. How you think is going to determine you know, your, your emotions, which one you hold to, which ones you don't hold to, and you hold to the right ones and you move in the right direction, and all of a sudden your life takes on an entirely different meaning and purpose um, and direction, you know, so that you're like, yeah, this is the life that God created me for. It doesn't mean you live a perfect life. It doesn't mean that you have no sin in your life. It means you have understood, though, which way to go. You know what to do, you know, with your struggles. You know who to turn to with your struggles. You know what, how, to, how to invest your time and, and how to work in life toward things that really matter. This is what, this is what Paul is pointing to. He's saying, listen, it, it's this understanding that causes you to move in this direction, and here's the result because you have figured out, you've let God teach you what really matters in life. Here's the third one. He says God has a purpose um, even in your most difficult days, because there will be difficult days. Paul had them. Joseph had them. You will have them. It doesn't mean that God has deserted you. It doesn't mean that God doesn't care. It means that God is moving you in a direction through those difficult days that it's the only way he could move you that direction. It's the only way he could get you there. It's the way he gets your attention, the way he gains your, your trust in him. Look at what he says in verse 12. He says, uh, this is very strong. He says, I want you to know. If you have a pen or pencil, you should circle those words. This is Paul emphatically. I want you to know this. I don't want you to be confused. I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, that everything has happened to me or everything that has happened to me here has helped spread the good news. He, he's saying everything that I've gone through, God has had a purpose in it. And I realize that. I recognize that looking back. Everything that I've gone through has a purpose in it. God is not, has not lost control. It's not like God can't direct me. He can. He has. And he says in verse 13, For everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I'm in chains because of Christ. And because of my imprisonment, most believers here have catched this. That means the people around him, they have done what? They have gained what? Confidence. And they, and they uh, boldly speak God's message, and they do it without fear. Wow. They've gained confidence. They're able to speak when the opportunity is there, and they'll speak boldly about who God is and, and who Christ is and how he leads us and he guides us, and they speak boldly without fear. It doesn't mean that, that it doesn't have its consequences. It does. They don't care. 
because they realize what is really important in life and they stay on that. And then finally, I look down in verse 15 and I, I notice how uh, uh, he was talking about how God is, is so good at, at seeing things with clarity and so good at helping us to, to weigh things out and, and make clear choices, understand um, the things that are the most important. Look at what he says in verse number uh, 15. He says, it is true. So he's being honest. He's being straight up with you. Here's the other side of it. It is true. Uh, some are preaching out of jealousy and rivalry. Yeah, happened then just like it happens now. Some are, are preaching the good news, but they're doing it with a really, really bad motive out of jealousy and rivalry. We're humans. We struggle. He goes on to say, but others preach about Christ with, say this part with me, what? Pure motives. Isn't that great? Others preach with, with pure motives. They've figured it out. They've yielded themselves uh, to God. He says, verse 16, they preach because they love me. For they know I have been appointed to defend the good news. This does not mean that they preach because they know, or Paul is saying because they know I never do anything wrong. <laughs> or my life never offends someone. Or, or people don't look at me and say, I'm a little jealous of, of Paul. He, and he's so outspoken, he's so bold. I'm, I'm a quieter type of person. He, he's not saying that at all. He says, but they realize, here's what they've decided is the most important thing. They realize I have been appointed for a task. So in the midst of my life, in the midst of my own struggles and my personality and all those things that, that are part of who I am, they don't let those things cause them to stumble because they realize what's important. They know this is, this is God's call on my life. This is where, you know, I'm headed. Jesus actually said this one time. He said, the one thing you want to make sure that you, that you don't do, he was saying this to the people around him, is, is stumble over me. And that's because Jesus, even though he was the son of God, and he was, he was also a human being. And so when you see human beings, it's easy to become jealous and to become frustrated and say, God, why them and why not me? Or maybe when something happens, happens bad, you really say, why not them, right, instead of me? You know, it's, it's easy to do that. It's just kind of a part of the way that we're wired. But don't do that. It, it, it confuses you. It gets you chasing all sorts of emotions and feelings in your life that you shouldn't be chasing in life. They're not the important ones. This is what he's being honest. He's, he's pointing this out. He goes on to say uh, this. He says, uh, verse 17, those others who do not have pure motives as they preach about Christ, they preach with selfish ambition, not sincerely, intending to make my chains more um, painful for me. In other words, here's how they were preaching. They were preaching the gospel, but they were saying, but Paul's a bad guy. You don't want to follow Paul. I don't really even like him. He's kind of arrogant and rude sometimes. Paul is one of those guys, you know, that you, you can't trust him. Don't, don't listen to him be a follower of Paul. Listen to and follow the things that, that we say, even though they were still preaching the gospel. Now, here's how Paul deals with it. This is really good. Look at verse, hang on to verse number 18 for a second. Look at this. He says, but that, say it with me, but that what? It doesn't matter. This is in contrast to way back up in verse number 10 where he talks about what really matters. Paul is saying, and this that I'm pointing to you, even though personally Paul felt the pain of it, he felt the intention of those people to cause him pain. But he says, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Whether their motives are false or genuine, the message about Christ is being preached either way. So I rejoice and I will say it with me. I'll what? I'll continue to rejoice. Wow. Just think about it. What if you could have a relationship with God that was so real and so intimate and so close that God could, could help you through the natural things that you feel, the natural uh, jealousy, uh, the natural you know, struggles that you go through, even when looking at other people. And so all of a sudden, all the people in the world, there are a lot of them, right? <laughs> and some of them intentionally want to make you mad and intimidate you. And, you know, yeah. What if, what if you could be free from that? Then the question is, how could you be free from that? And the answer is actually very simple. There's only one way you could be free from that. Because you look to God and you listen to God and you say, here's the one that's leading me and directing me. 
Here's the one that's helping me to make decisions. I feel that. I understand what someone else feels. Paul understands it. He felt it. But I'm not going to respond to that because this is more important. That's of less importance. And I made some choices to the emotions and the feelings that are going to help direct my life that I'm going to hold on to. I'm going to make sure those are what fills my bag as I, as I travel. See, Paul started out his letter saying this, I always feel joy and happiness when I think about you guys and I pray for you guys. Now, even in his talking, you know, some of these people that he's talking about, maybe some of the ones who are preaching against him, he still says, I still feel joy and happiness for you guys. I pray for you guys. You're, you're the joy of my heart, all because of who Jesus was, who God was. And the fact when he looked at us, he saw our struggles, our difficulties, and somehow that didn't matter as much as God's love for us. He was merciful to us, showed grace for us. He cared for us so much. You got kids, had kids? Kids ever make you mad? Anybody? Kids ever hurt your feelings? <laughs> have they? Sure they have. Does that call you, cause you to uh, throw them out on the street? Well, yeah, but not for very long. You know, you just you bring them back in. Sure, because they're your kids. I love to tell the story. My, my son doesn't remember this, but one time I had to tell him that he couldn't go to a party, teenage years, and it was, it was such a good lesson uh, for me. And uh, as he goes back upstairs, I, he thinks I've walked off, but all of a sudden I stopped and I, I grabbed some mail or something, so I'm standing to where I can hear him as he goes up the, the steps, and, um, and I hear him say, jerk. <laughs> yeah. Now, did, did it make me mad? No, of course not. I'm, you know, my halo was still in. No. Oh, yes, it did. I wanted to go and say, hey, let me tell you something. You know, I want to go through the lecture about who pays the bills and how, you know, I want, you know, I want, you ever, you ever done that? Yeah. I want to go through all of those things. Of course I did. It hurt my feelings. Hey, listen, I've hurt his feelings before. He, he's looking at my decision. He doesn't like my decision. I understand, you know. Why, why would I expect him to, to, oh, Dad, thank you so much for telling me I can't go to the party that I want to go to and that all my friends are going to, and I'll look like the only one that, know, you know, thank you for that, that, that you're about to put me into. Of course not. He, he didn't feel that way. But you love your son, right? You love your daughter. You love your child. And so you say, that's not as important that's not as important as other things. And you hold on to the things that matter. Let's pray together. And Heavenly Father, we, we just want to say thank you that you're the kind of father that loves his children, that you, you hang on to us. Um, somehow your love is so great that, that you can hear the things that we say and know the things that we feel and, and you just get through those things and you continue to push for the things that matter, the things that are so important. You listen to us. You, you know what we, what we feel inside and you hang on to us, calling us to learn to listen to you so that we would find the direction that we need in life. Here this morning, and I don't know, for some reason, You've just never thought that God wanted you to come close to him. Maybe God always seemed distant to you. Maybe because you had a distant parent also. And maybe this morning for the first time you've realized that's not God's intention at all. That God has always wanted you to know him, to come to him with your struggles, the good things and the bad things with the questions that you have. In fact, God's always wanted you to come to him first as you're making decisions, as you're trying to figure out which way to go so that he can help you wade through the emotions and the feelings that you have to find clarity and hope and move in a direction that is his direction and ultimately will lead to really good things ahead. You never put your hope in Jesus Christ. God sent his son into this world so that you would know how much he loves you. And Jesus gave his life so that your faults and your struggles and your sins would not be held against you. He took them on himself to set you free. 
And he did it so that you could, you could know that you could know your heavenly father. So this morning, I can't think of anything that would be more important than you to say, I, I want to know you. I want to follow you. I want you to lead me, to teach me. I know it won't be easy. I know I have a lot of struggles, but if I could have you to come to, to run to, in the midst of all of those struggles, what a difference it would make. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.